Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we continue to discuss graphical models. Um, graphical models, we said, are ways to represent joint probability distribution or a compact way to represent joint probability distribution and mainly used for uh, inference. So basically, if we know something about some of the values and we want to infer um, about other values that we haven't observed or that we cannot observe even if um, uh, uh, even if we observe everything. Like, as we said, for example, in speech recognition, we can't really observe the words, but we want to infer based on the, 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 the wave sound that you make. So this is the idea of graphical models. And, and within graphical models, we discussed based on network, which are very general uh, graphical models. And last time I motivated some downsides or motivated why based on networks are not necessarily the solution to all of the problems or to all of the real world scenarios we would like to represent. And I discussed a few cases where they are not going to be uh, useful because of the very strong assumption that based in network make, which is that the world, uh, that, 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 that the interactions are in a directed acyclic graphs. So one solution, there are other solutions that we, I mentioned that we are not going to talk about in this class, but the graphical models are a big class of Models, one solution is something called undirected graphical models, which we'll not discuss. But another solution is another form of directed graphical models, which we loosens some of the uh, requirements of the Bayesian networks, but you know, on the other hand, it has a different type of assumption or makes very strong assumptions um, that Bayesian network do not make. And these are called the hidden Markov models. We uh, defined them informally last time. Today, we are going to formally define them. And more importantly, we are going to discuss what type of questions we can ask about or when we have these networks and how can we answer them. Remember in Bayesian network, we said there is no way to answer in polynomial time inference problems, or at least not generally. We can do some approximation or sometimes we can if we use some algorithms, but in general, there is no way to do a inference in based on networks in polynomial time. That's not true for hidden Markov models where we actually have very efficient and very nice polynomial inference algorithms. So let's define them a bit more formally and then talk about inference. Um, so based on, uh, so based on hidden Markov models we mentioned contain two components. One is a set of hidden states that generates the observation. For example, the word they speak to you that you don't see or you don't hear. And the second is the observation, which are the sounds that my mouth makes when I say the words, the waveforms. The hidden states generate the next hidden state. So when I say a word, the next word is related to what I said before. And they so, so the word is related to the next word or the previous word. And it's also the one that generates the observation, which in this case is the sound. Right. So this is an example we said we will use um, for this class, but of course the hidden Markov models are more general, but let's assume that I'm, I have two dice, um, die A and dice B, and, and I, you know, I, I flip one of them, and after I flip it, I get some output, one to six, and with probability 0.2, I next time use the same one, and 0.8, I switch between them. Okay, so this is the meaning of these edges. Sorry, the other way around. So point eight, I stay with the same one. Point two, I move to the other one. I flip it again. So the second output is coming from the second state. The third output comes from the third state and so forth and so forth. So what do you need or what do you formally need in order to define a hidden Markov model? Or what are the set of parameters that we need to formally define a hidden Markov model? The first thing is a set of states. These states are hidden. So for example, the set of words that I can say, or in this case, the two dice that I wrote. You don't see them, you only, I can only tell you what is the output, one, two, three, four, and so forth. We assume that at each time point or each observation that we have is coming from one of these states. So if I show you a number one, one, two, five, one, six, each one of these values came from die A or die B. You don't know which one, or at least initially you don't know, that's one of the inference question challenges. But each time point, we are at a specific state, the state generates an observation and moves to the next state. The next state could be the same as before, it could be a different state, that's depending on the model, okay? 
So these are the states in the model and these are defined. So we don't learn them. Usually this is part of the definition. Next, we have something called pi i, which is the initial probability. Before we start, what's the probability that we will start in state A or in state B? In this case, I'm listing these as 0.5, but of course they can be different. This is the, end, the, the, the initial state, okay? So if, what's, the, what's the probability that the first word I will say was welcome? Just as an example. Okay, so pi i is the probability. It's a special probability because it's not related to movement between the states. It's the probability of the first state. Next, we have something that is more general, and this is something called a transition probability. A transition probability is what's the probability of being in, in state J if I'm now at state I. Think about a robot moving in a room, right? And, and each, let's say each, uh, we define some grid on the room and each location is a point in the grid. You can say, what's the probability that I will be at this location given that I'm now at this location, and this location, right? Some locations I cannot get within a step, so the probability will be zero. Some locations are close, so I can get there, but you know, there are others, so there is some probability. Similarly, um, if I flip a die, there is, in this case, as we said, 80% probability that the next one will be the same, but 20% probability that it will be, that I'm switching it. Okay, so this is called the transition probability going from one state to the other. We have a set of possible outputs similar to the set of states. We need to define what is the possible output of each state. For example, if my states are words, then the outputs are waveforms, the sound that I make, the forms of the sound. If the states are dies, then the output is a discrete number between one and six. If the state is a robot or, or location, then the output is a continuous value, maybe about the distance between the robot and the wall, right? Each setting or each set of states might have a different uh, set of outputs and this has to be defined. That's part of the definition. So you cannot see, for example, in a die, if I say that the states are die one and die two, you cannot observe 5.37. That's not a valid output. The, the output has to be defined. In a robot setting, you can, but if you look at sensors, for example, you cannot observe a negative value because this is the distance to the wall. The distance has to be positive, okay? Or not to, so you, that defines at least some restrictions on the set of information. And the last thing is something called the emission probability. What's the probability that if I'm in state A, I will see value K from the allowed values, right? So for example, if I'm a robot, and I know the location of the robot, I know the distance from the wall, but of course there might be some noise in my emission. So I can say that there is a, let's say I'm five feet from the wall. So there is a probability that I'll get five, but maybe there's also a probability that I'll see 5.2 from the same location or 5.3, a very, very low probability of 6.1 and so forth, okay? So for each state and each output, there is a probability associated with seeing this output from the state. Now, if the, Emission, if, if the outputs are discrete, the probability is usually a discrete probability, right? It could be binomial, it could be multinomial, whatever. If the, pro, if the values are continuous, like in sensor, you need a continuous probability distribution because you have to be able to accomplish. But that's up to you to define. Okay, so the parameters, right? So we have the states, which are not parameters, they are defined, and we have the vocabulary, which is also defined, but we have a set of parameters. The parameters are the initial probability, the transition probability and the emission probability. These are the set of parameters. In terms of the number of parameters, we have one initial probability parameter for each state. We have n square, let's say there's n state, we have n square transition probability. That's why usually we call it a transition probability matrix because we have to know the transition probability from one state to each of the other states. It could be zero. Of course, they have to sum to one because if you are in a state, there is a, the sum of the states you can move to has to be one. But you have to define, or, or that's part of the model, the definition of what's the probability of moving from every state to every other state, including itself. Okay, so you can stay in the same states, that's part of the model. And also we have the emission probability model, the number of parameters we need for that depends on the distribution that we assume, right? So if we have a die, then we need six for each state. If we have a coin, then maybe two, or maybe one actually, because one minus ten is total. Okay, so that's really a function of the model we assume. But these are the parameters of the model. One key observation we can make already before we go into the um, into inference is this idea of transition. Now, I mentioned it as a definition, but if you think about it, it's not really trivial, right? So the Markov probability says 
that if order to know where you will be next, it's important or it's only required to know where you are now. Okay, that's a critical assumption. That's the Markov property. And this is what makes Markov, hidden Markov models very powerful because that's the only reason why we can do inference in a reasonable polynomial time. But it also is a weakness because in many cases that's not true, right? Let me show you an example of, of this assumption and, and where it's a problem. So let's say I'm drawing a line like this, okay? So, you know, let's say this is the value at time t minus one. This is the value at time t. And now you want to know the probability of time t plus one. Then, you know, if I went from t minus one to t, then it's, I mean, that's the trajectory. Then this, there is some pretty high probability that in t plus one, I will be in this state and not for example, in this state, right? I mean, it's unlikely that I'll change direction here. However, if I came from here, then you may say that, you know, I'll continue to go here. But if we assume the Markov assumption, then you have to say the probability of the next state just based on the value at T. You don't know where you came from. Of course, you can increase that, but, but based on the hidden Markov model assumption, you only observe this point here. And then the question is, did they come? I mean, and now you want to know what's the probability of being here or being here. Well, you say, I want to know whether I came from down here or from or up here. You're not allowed to see that. You're only allowed to see the previous time. So again, that's a very strong assumption. Usually wrong, right? If you're a robot and you're moving around the room, then you would likely go on the same trajectory. So the fact that you are here, right? In order to know where you will be next, it's very important to know where you came from. It's not enough to know that you're here, but in the hidden Markov model, we assume that it's enough to know where you are in order to know or in order to say. So that's a strong assumption. It's wrong in many cases, but it definitely helps a lot in doing inference. And um, in some cases, that's not a terrible assumption. There are ways around it. Maybe I will talk about them later or, or actually in, 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 next, in the next classes. But for now, that's the assumption we're going to make. Okay, so this is called the Markov property, a very strong assumption. Um, like other assumptions we made, for example, in naive base, when we assume things are independent conditional the label, usually not correct, but makes our life pretty easy, as you will see when we do it. Okay, so we are, uh, uh, um, or we believe the Markov assumption, or at least we accept the Markov assumption. And if that's the case, then in order to define the probability of the next step, where I only need to know what's the probability in this step, in this state, and for that, I have the transition probability table, right? So I have from each state, I know the probabilities to that. Okay, so for now, so there's two things you want to do when you see such definition, right? When you see this definition, maybe there's two things. First of all, maybe the first question you ask is how do we get these values? How do we get the probability pi i? How do we get the transition probabilities? How do we get the emission probabilities? That's something that we will answer, but not in this lecture. Okay, this is important and this is called learning, right? These are probabilities that we need to estimate, learning probabilities. In this lecture, we are going to focus on inference. Inference means that you know, you assume you know these probabilities and then you want to ask questions. That doesn't make sense. Why, why shouldn't we start with learning and then do inference? Because we need, the answer is that for learning, we need to do inference. Okay, so we will use what we learn. And so what we're going to talk about in this lecture is inference. It's important, of course, even if you know, but it's also useful for the learning. So we, 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 so we will do the learning in the next lecture. We'll start with inference, even though in practice, you of course need to learn the values before you can use the network, okay? But, but other than that, it's, it's fine. Okay, so, so what type of questions can we ask? Let's say we defined a base, a, a hidden bar. Someone gave us all the parameters. So they gave us, of course, the states and emission and, 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 and the state and dictionary is something we define and someone gave us also all the probabilities. What can we do with them? So for example, in this model, we can ask, okay, now you flip the dice seven times. I want to know what dice are you using now? Even if I haven't seen any output, I just want to know in advance at the seventh uh, state, which die will you use? 
or I can ask what's the probability of six, right? You're going to Vegas, you, you want to, uh, you know, the, the dealer is switching between two dice and you want to know what's the probability of six. Maybe one of them is skewed to higher numbers and one is skewed to a lower number. This is a very important question because if you know the higher probability for six, then you can make some money. Um, and of course, what's the probability for six in any of the next three worlds? It's false. Okay, so we are going to uh, discuss the following specifically. These are all inference problems. We are going to define, and, and they can all be solved or with what we are going to learn. And specifically, we are going to define or solve the following three or four inference questions. The first is computing P of Q. So what's the probability of a set of states? What's the probability, for example, that we will see A, B, B, A as the states? N P Q T given equals S I. So for example, what's the probability that the seventh state will use the first die, die A? Okay, that's inference of the state. And you can see here, I'm not assuming anything about the observation. So this doesn't take into account the observation. Even before I start, what's the probability that in the seventh state, I will be at um, state A, for example. The second part is already taking, is starting to take into account the observation. So let's say that I've seen the first six states. I want to know what, it, sorry, the first six observations. So I saw one, two, one, one, two, three. I want to know what's the probability that in state six, I am at die A or die B. Or what's the probability that the, the set of states that led to this observation is A, A, B, B, A, A. Right, this is important. For example, when we do speech processing, you want to know what's the sentence that I said, given the observations. And the last thing is something called uh, argmax, which is um, not the probability of a sentence, but the most likely sentence or the most likely set of states. So this will give you a probability for any set of states, but the number of set of states is exponential, right? If we have two possible states, you can find the probability for any of them, but it's two to the power of something. This will give you the value of the best one. Okay, or well, this will find you the best one. And can, you can compute easily the problem. So this is the inference problems. Let's start with the simplest or the first one and then do them by order. So, um, so the first question is, we want to know what is the probability of being in die A in the seven time point, right? Without seeing any observation. So the assumption is we cannot observe any, any of, uh, any, any value. We just want to know what's the probability if we have this model that after seven rounds, because we have these transition probabilities, we will end up with state A or state B. In this case, only two states. So how can we compute it? Well, the simple answer is in order to finish it, to be in A in the seventh state, we can be in any of a set of states in the first six, and then in the last part, we have to transition to the A, right? So if we sum over all possible sets of states for the first six, and for each one we compute what's the probability of them and then also A, or basically if we compute all the possible sets of seven states where the first six are unconstrained and the last one is A, then we will get the probability of A because eventually, I mean, for, for any time we, we ended the day, we had to be in one of the states in the first, I mean, we had to be in a state each of the six previous time points. Okay, so if we sum over all of these possible combinations, we can get the probability of it. But how do we sum over all of them? Well, we can, for each one, right? So this is like one of the, again, so, so I'm putting a lowercase q to denote the fact that q1 can be a or b. QT1 can be A or B. Okay, so they can be either of them. For each one, I want to compute what's the probability. So how do we compute the probability of Q? If I give you a set of states, what's the probability of A, A, B, B, A, A? Then you can use, um, you can use the chain rule, right? So the probability of Q1 to QT1 A is P of A condition on Q1 to QT minus one. This is true for any, any set of values it doesn't require any assumptions, right? This is just a chain. However, now we can use the Markov assumption. The Markov assumptions tells us that the probability of the seventh state is only conditioned if I know on the probability on the value of the previous state. And it's independent of anything that happened before that, right? So if we do that, we can basically say that this basically comes down to P of A 
P of A given QT minus one, P of T and so forth times P of T one, which is the initial state. And any of these, we can directly go into the parameters and compute, right? This is the initial probability, and this is the and, and these are the transition probabilities. These are this, so these are really values. So this can be a two, a one. This can be a b, a a, a b, and so forth. We just go to the problem, and any set of states you give me, I can tell you what's the probability for that set of states using the Markov property and the transition probability matrix. So how do we use that? Well, we just sum over all possible sets of states where we end up with a. And uh, we get the solution. And, and basically, right, we have to finish in A, but the first six states are not constrained. So we sum over all possible sets of six states and, um, and, and compute the probability of these six plus A at the end. And the sum over them is really the probability that we end up in A. Okay, everybody sees that. Um, this works, unfortunately, um, this is very time consuming. So how much time will it take us to compute this for a two state uh, model? Anybody can tell me in the chat. So we need to compute all possible states up to let's say seven. Yeah, so this is exponential. This will take two to the power of n because for each location we can have one of two states, A or B. And, and based, so it's two to the power of the number of location, in this case six. So it's two to the power of six possible combinations. So that's, Definitely doable, but time consuming. That's not a good idea. So how can we um, still solve it in a reasonable time? So we're going to do something we'll do quite a lot. And this is, um, right, so this is very long, right? So this is exponential in T, which is too long. Instead, we are going to do an induction in order to compute this in a very, very, short amount of time. We'll discuss exactly how long, how much this takes in, in a second, but let me just say first how we do it. So let's define a new, a, 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 a new parameter, which I call PT of I. So PT of I is not part of the model, but we compute it on the fly. T is the state, is the number, and I is the state, okay? So PT of I, just the definition, it's the probability that QT equals SI. I didn't say how to compute it, but that's the definition. Okay, what's the probability that in time seven, I am in state eight? How can we determine it? Well, for the first one, it's easy. It's just the initial probability. We can just go to the model and ask what's the probability at time one being in state I or, I or B, that's in the model. What about PT of I? Well, if I know the probability of PT minus one, then if I want to go now to I at time T, the only thing I can do is transition from another state to myself. And the probability of that is the probability of transition from J, let's say, to I, plus the probability of being in J in the first place. So PT of I is just a sum over all possible states, including I itself, okay? So we are not excluding the state of transitioning from that state to I in the seventh state and the, and the, the probability we already computed in the induction of T minus one J, okay? So this is very easy to compute. Basically, uh, it computes all of the possible settings, but it does it in much more efficient steps. How long does it take to compute it? Well, we need to do it t times, right? Because we want to get to the seven. So we need to do it t times. So each step, or we have seven steps or t steps. Each step here, we need to sum over all possible states. So this is one n, and we need to do it for all states. So this is the second n. So each step is, or each time point is n squared because we are doing a, a summation over n values, right? All the possible n states, and we have to do it for all the states. Even if we just want to compute it for A at the end, we need to do it along in the intermediate for all of the other states. So this will take over, over O n squared T, which is polynomial and very efficient compared, of course, to the previous solution, um, where well, n is the number of states and T is the time point that you are, that you are interested in, right? The probability that state seven is eight, for example. And, and, and the basic idea, and um, this is not, I mean, the algorithm we'll use is, is just this, but this is also known as dynamic programming uh, where you basically fill up a table in this case. And, and you just, I mean, once you filled up the previous entries, it's easy to fill up the next one, right? This is what we do here. Once we know P of T minus one, it's easy to fill the next one for this because we just use it. I just want to make a, a comment. I'm not going to prove it, 
oh, I, I owe you an explanation. So let me just make that comment and then something I owe you guys. Um, um, so I, I, I'm going to make a comment. I'm not going to prove it, but it's actually a nice thing to know. It's not necessarily something unique to Markov models, uh, to hidden Markov models. It's, some, it's a property of any Markov model. So hidden Markov models assumes that there is an emission and a transition. There are something called the Markov model, which we are not going to discuss, where you don't assume that you have an emission, you just observe the state and you have the transition, there's no emission. That's the same idea, but without the emissions. It turns out, and that's an interesting property of Markov models um, that is good to know, that if you want to know, so let's say you know that you're in state A now and you want to know what's the probability of being in state B in the next iteration or in the next time point. Then you look at the transition probability table and you say, okay, what's the probability of transition from A to B? Now, what if I want to know what's the probability of being in B in two steps? It turns out that you can take the transition probability, take it to the power of two and use that to compute that. And three steps and so forth. So you can always do it for, for exponential number of states. But an interesting observation that again, we're not proving it's a statement, is that if you take this transition probability table to a high enough power, basically at the limit when it's exponent, when it reaches, when it leads to infinity, then each state has its own lending probability. So basically you get a vector where you expect it to be for a probability for each of the state and it doesn't matter where you start. So if this is I, if this is J, if this is, it doesn't matter, right? This is just a function of J. So if I, let's say I'm at state I and I do infinitely many states, any, many steps, then the probability that I will end up in any of the other states is independent of where I started. Okay, this is a property of a Markov model. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not, but I do want to mention it. The reason why I'm mentioning it here is because this is independent of the emission. If you have emissions, it's different, but this is if you don't see any emissions. One other thing, I, last time I was asked about the polytree algorithm and why the polytree algorithm is, 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 is um, linear, right? I, uh, not linear, why is it simple to compute the polytree algorithm? Polytree, just for those who don't remember, is a, a basic network where each, or there is only one path from a node to any other node. Okay, this is direct, obviously, so there's only one direct path from one node to any other node. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no way to reach um, one node, uh, or, or there's no way to reach from one node to another node in two different paths. And it turns out that the algorithm is not uh, that complicated, but it's based on something called message passing, where you get information from your no from the node above you and the node below you. You integrate it. And it turns out that in polytree, because of the structure of the uh, tree, you are guaranteed that this will converge very quickly. Whereas in other models, which are not polytree, it can take a long time because everybody is updating themselves and update, but in polytree, this convergence is much faster. So the algorithm would work on all of the basic networks. The problem is the time. And in polytree, you can show that this is very quick. In other models, it does, it's not quick. That's why it's exponential. Oh, we know already that it's NP complete problem. Okay, so this is something that I owed you from last time. But anyway, this is uh, about inference in, in uh, so, but let's go back right, to inference in hidden Markov models, which is where we are. And we finish the first step, you know, inference problem. Okay, so basically if you know, or if you know the model, if you have the parameters of the model, transition and initial probability, in this case, we haven't used the, we didn't use emission, the then you can say, what's the probability of being in a specific time point at a specific state? Okay, so this is the first thing. The next inference problem we'll ask is what's the probability of a set of states given a set of observations? Okay, so now we start to take observations into account. For example, let's say that A and B, so this is the transition probability, it looks symmetric, but in terms of emission, they are different. If you see low values, it's likely to come from A, and if you see high values, it's likely to come from B. Now you're in Vegas, right? And you know that if you were in B, it, you're very likely to stay in B. So you really want to know, given the emissions you saw so far, which die the dealer is using. You can't see that the dealer, the die, you can just see the output, right? So if you know that the, the dealer is using B, then you would likely bet on higher numbers. Question is, how can you tell which die it is, right? That's the, that's the question. Okay, so this is again, I mean, we are not talking about learning. So we assume that all of these values are given to us. We know the emission probability, we know the transition, we know the initial, these are given. And now we want to ask, right? 
Uh, right, so this is like the emission. Does it change our belief? And the answer is yes, right? If we see very high values, it's very likely we're in B. Okay, so let's say we want to compute the probability. Oh, I should say, this is the probability that in state seven, we are at A, given that we observed the values of one to seven. Okay, this is the notation. So let's say we want to compute the probability that we are now, or we ended in state seven, in state at time seven in state A, given that we observed all the values up to and including seven. Okay, this is the probability we want to compute. I'm going to use slightly different notations. It's not changing anything, it's just to make the notations shorter. So I'm going to call AJI the transition probability of moving from J to I. Okay, so going from J to I. I'm defining that as AJI. Going from J, state J, probability of J. And BIOT is the emission probability of whatever we observe the time T if we are in state I. Okay, so for example, if I see a one, and, I, and state I is A, what's the probability of seeing one from die A? And if state I is B, what's the probability of seeing one? That's just notations I've been doing. Okay, so we want to compute the probability that after we saw a set of observation, we are really at a specific state. Let's start with a simple question and then we'll go to uh, the more, or, or, and then we'll answer this question. So let's say that I give you a set of observations sorry, a set of states, let's say A, A, B, 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 A. And I want you to know, to tell me what's the probability of that state given the emissions. Okay, so basically you, you see the observations, one, one, two, what's the probability of this set of states? We already said there's exponentially many possible states, so maybe that's not always useful, but sometimes it's pretty, it is useful. Sometimes in speech, let's say we have some sentences we have in mind and we see the observation, we don't need to look at all possible combination of words because we have some sentence. We just want to rank these sentences, these set of words given the observation. So that might be useful, right? Even if I don't, um, but, but even if it's not, treat it as an intermediate solution to the big question, which is definitely important. What's the state I'm at at this time point after I saw some observation? Okay, so everybody understand that that's the question we're going to solve. We're going to solve the probability of Q given O. Q is a set of states and O is the set of observations. Here we can use base rule, obviously. So Q, P of Q given O is P of O given Q times P of Q divided by P of O. P of O given Q because of the hidden Markov model assumption that each observation is only a function of the state. And if I tell you what are the states, this is very easy to compute. It's just the probability of the first observation given Q1, whatever you said Q is given. So let's say A, B, B, A. So this is the first of one given one, given A, two given B, three given B, four given B and so forth, right? So this is easy to compute. Just going to the tables and uh, the, the, the so just going to the parameters and computing it. P of Q is also easy to compute. We just said that P of Q is uh, easy to compute, right? It's just the initial probability of Q1 and, and transitions from Q2, Q1 to Q2, Q2 and so forth. So these two are very easy to compute. If you, again, assuming that I give you a set of states. The last thing is P of O, that's how to compute. So how do we compute P of O? What's the probability of an observation? By the way, this is something we are computing as part of computing P of Q, you know, but actually P of O itself is an interesting a, a, a quantity to compute. Why is that? In many cases, not in many, but there are cases where we use HMMs for classification. So we have two models. One, let's say for, let's say this, let's say we have a robot and we want to predict which room the robot is in. Is it in this room and that room? And we see a set of measurements of the robot. So I can compute what's the probability that the robot is in this room because I have a hidden Markov model for this room and I compute the probability for that room. So I can compute P of O, the set of observations given basically P of O is for a specific hidden Markov model. So if I know how to compute it, I can do classification. If I have two different models, I can run the observations on one, see what's the probability, run it on the other and take the one that has the higher probability. Again, this is just a side note, but it's sometimes it's useful. Okay, so let's say we want to, but regardless, let's say we want to compute P of O either because we want to do classification or we want need it for our derivation. How do we compute P of O? So again, we are going to use this induction. Now I'm going to define a slightly different parameter. I'm calling it alpha T of I. Again, it's just the definition. Alpha T of I is defined as all the observations up to time T and, so this is not condition, this is end, 
QT equals the sum. So basically all the observations and ending up in state SI. Okay, this is not what, what, what we want to compute is the condition. So this is just a joint, but let's say we want, let's say this is something we compute. Okay, so alpha T of I is we observe all the observations and we end up in state. That's the only thing that is. So how do we, comp so, so let's first say how we comp compute it and then see how we use it, okay? So let's st stick with me for a second on how we compute it and then you will see why it's useful. How do we compute alpha T of I? Um, so as before, we are going to do an induction. Alpha one of I, so T is the time and I is the state. Alpha one of I is defined as the P of O1 and Q1 equals I. We can use the chain rule, P of O1 given Q times P of Q I, which is basically the initial probability. This is the emission. So we have that, so that's easy to compute. Okay, so this should be easy. We already computed this. Okay, and now let's assume that we computed alpha t minus one and we want to move, so let's go, let's assume that we computed alpha t and we want to move to alpha t plus one. Alpha t plus one by definition, our definition, it's the joint of all the observations up to t plus one plus ending up in state SI, alpha t plus one of i, right? Okay, how do we uh, 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 operate on this? Or how do we, um, how do we uh, 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 basically derive a formula for this. So the goal would be, and I'll say in a second the, the actual steps, but just to motivate the goal, the goal would be to get into a state where we can use alpha t itself, right? I mean, because we already computed alpha t, alpha t, we are computing alpha t plus one, we want to compute alpha t. Not necessarily for i, we can use it for j because we computed alpha t for all the states. So how do we do that? This is the summation rule, right? We know that in state T, we have to be in one of the, sorry, in time T, we have to be in one of the states. So I can add state, the state at time T into the uh, end, but I have to sum over all the states because I can be in any of the states. So now if I have this end, basically I take what I have here and I add an end in the summation rule that basically covers all the possibilities, right? I have to be in one of the states at the previous time point. So I'm adding all of the possible states. So, so far, this is the summation rule, okay? Now we can use the chain rule to break it. And from here, it's going to be pretty easy, right? We use the chain rule. This is, again, by definition, P of OT and QT equals SI condition on this times P of this, right? Just divided the date, the, the, the variables into two sets. One set we conditioned on and then we compute the prior one, that's it. Okay, now, what is this? What is P of O1 to OT and QT equals SJ? That's our definition of alpha TJ, right? That's definition, so that's easy that we have. What about this? We have OT plus one, QT plus one conditioned on a lot of observations and the previous state. We said already that if we know the previous state, we are independent of everything else that happened before that, and also the emission, because the emission is only a function of the state. So in this case, we can drop all the observations and just stay with QT equals SI. Okay, so that's what we get. We get um, alpha T of J, and here we still, I mean, here in the next step, I'm dropping it. So I'm dropping everything, just uh, remaining QT of SJ. And here I can use the chain rule again and get P of QT plus one, condition on this and P of OT condition on QT plus one. Okay, so I use the chain rule again here and, and then I get basically this uh, function. This function uses all the values that we know. Alpha TJ we computed in the first step. This is the transition probability and this is the emission probability. Okay, so this is uh, the way to derive alpha T plus one. So we can easily, not easily, but we can derive alpha T plus one. Once we derive alpha T plus one, let's see how we use it, just one comment. Um, if you look at the slides on PDF, you will see like you will see it like this. You will not see all the derivations. I uploaded a new version of the slides today, where the last slides contained this slide uh, without all the move movements. So you have all this in the, for those who don't see it in the PDF. Okay, so just download the new version. Okay. So again, so just as an example, how do we compute this alpha value? It's right. So let's say this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the model we have, and we have the probability of starting in 8.7, starting in 8.3. These are the transition probability, the emission probability. Alpha one a is 
just by definition, right? Think, so we observe two, three, and six. So the first value we observed is two. So it's observing two and finishing in state A, which is just a P of two given A, the, the, the emission probability of two for state A, which is 0.2 times the initial probability 0.7. So it's this, and we compute the same for B. And then once we have alpha one for A, alpha one for B, we can compute alpha two for A using, as we said, this induction step and alpha two for B, and then we compute also alpha three for A and alpha three for B. Okay, so this is just inserting values into the into, into the equation. Once we have the, uh, 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 the this equation, we can just put the values from the emission transition and the previous step. Please. Okay, so let's go back to our problem. So we want to compute P of Q given O. We said for this, we only need to compute P of O, but we didn't really compute P of O, we computed P of alpha T. So how do we compute P of O? Well, again, we can use the summation rule. If, you, if I want to compute P of O, which is basically P of O1 to OT, right? That's the observation. We have to be in a specific state at time T. So we just sum over all the states I, O1 to OT and QT equals SI, which by definition is alpha T of I. So if I sum over I alpha T of I, I get P of O, which is what we wanted. Okay, so now we can compute. Remember, we wanted to compute P of Q given O. We said that we can compute the numerator very easily. The denominator uh, is, is a bit harder, but it can be computed, right? This is P of O. Now we can go back to our original question, which was how do we compute the probability of being in state T at time, sorry, at state I in time T, right? What's the probability that we are at state A at time seven after we saw the first seven observations? And, uh, and that is basically, uh, um, Right, this is basically the conditional that we started with. And if you do, uh, uh, right, if we do this as P of A given B is P of A and B divided by P of B, right? This is the chain rule. Um, so the chain rule is P of A and B equals P of A given B times P of B, we can divide it. Then this is, right, P of A given B, if QT is A and O is B, then we said already that this is the joint, Right, this is the probability of uh, of being at state i and observing O1 to OT. That's alpha t over i, alpha t i, and the probability of O is just sum over j alpha t j. So the probability of being at any state at the last time point condition on all the observations is alpha t of i for that state divided by now alpha t, the sum over alpha t, which is the probability of. O. Okay, so once we know how to compute alpha we can solve both the, the general probability of P of Q given O, which we said is important or can be important. We can compute the probability of O this way because the probability of O is just the sum over the alphas for the last time point. And we can also compute the conditional. How long did it take? Well, computing a, a P of Q given O is, you know, the, 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 the numerator is very quick. The denominator takes n squared t. Why does it take n squared t? Again, if we go to this induction, then we see that in each iteration, we need to do, right? In order to compute it and up to the last time point, we need to do t times. At each time, we sum over all the states. So that's n. And we have to do it for all of the states, right? So we do it alpha t plus one a, alpha t plus one b, see if we have n squared. So this is, and n for each state, we have n states. And square times t, it's n squared. Right, and, and the numerator is there. Any questions on this, on, 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 on doing the inference, uh, basically, and finding the last state or the most likely? No, okay, good. So uh, the next thing is to compute the argmax. So again, here we only computed the probability of a specific value or a specific set of states. But in many cases, we want to know what is the most likely set of states. For example, in speech recognition, that's the next step. But before that, let's do a short quiz on, 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 on hidden Markov model inference. Let me open this for you. Um, so two questions on hidden Markov models. Um, And in this, I actually, um, as you can see, I, I write the um, the parameters or the model is fully defined by the figure. Um, the incoming edge that doesn't have 
is not coming from any node is basically um, right. It's the initial probability. Okay, so this model defines um, almost all the probabilities um, that you need. Yes, yeah, so so for the second question, oh, 1,000 or 10,000 means the 10,000 observation. Oh, I think it's 10,000, is it 1,000? Yeah, the, what's the probability that the 10,000 observation is A or B, basically? Okay, so the first question I asked you was, uh, I give you an HMM, the HMM is fully defined, so you have all the emission probabilities listed in each state. Um, you didn't have to use them in this question, but in general, um, they are listed here. And these are the transition probabilities. Um, I'm missing one transition probability, I didn't write it here. But we know that transition probabilities, that's actually an important thing, they have to sum to one. So the probability of going from one from this state to any of the other state has to sum to one because this is 0.5 and this is 0.3. This has to be 0.2, okay? Because you know you have to go from one state to one of the other states in the mix. So they have to the sum of the transition probabilities is one, and so the probability of being in and we know that we start in S1. We have to start in S1. So the probability of starting in S1, moving from S1 to S1, and then moving to S3 is Starting for S1 is 1 times 0.5 times, in this case, 0.2. So it's the third answer is the right answer. And most of you got it correct. So this didn't use emissions. It was just inference on transition probabilities. What about when we have emissions? So in this case, um, I'm giving you a, another a, a, a hidden Markov model. Again, here that the starting point is always 1. Uh, transition probabilities are listed and these are terminal states. So once you get to this state or this state, you never leave. In this state, you can stay for a long time um, as long as you. Now you can see that for the key observation here, and, and most of you got it correct, is that A and B are symmetric except for state three, right? So if you spend all your time in state uh, uh, S1, which has some probability, or if you start at S1 and move at some stage to S2, then the probability of A and B is the same. But if you move to state three, you had to output A. Since there is some probability, as we said, that you end up in, in state three, in fact, it's pretty high that you will end up in state three, it's almost half. I mean, I'm not, I didn't tell you how to compute it, but it's at least half, roughly half the time you will end up in state A. Um, in that case, the, the probability of A is much larger, right? Because if you are in B or, or if you're in state one or state two, then it's equal. But here it's A is much higher and there is a non-zero probability that you'll be here. So the total probability for A would be higher. And again, the nice thing here or the important thing here is that you don't really need to compute. That's why these are the things that we like, for example, in exam questions. We don't, we can ask you questions about 10,000. You don't really need to compute the probability of 10,000. You just need to see that it's more likely that it's an A rather than B. So that's the key point of this question. It's not so much, right? my goal was not that you really compute or do inference on this, just understand what does it mean to have a higher probability. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, the set of question. And, and, and these are actually, you know, I would say on the easy side, but, but not very different from exam questions that we ask on, on, on HMMs, okay? And basically, if you understand it, yeah. If there's a quick question, uh, someone is asking if state two and state three weren't terminal, like say you had like a 50% chance of going back to state one, would the answer still be the same? I think yes, but. Right. So let's say, right. So let's say, yeah. So the, again, Daniel is correct. This will be the same again, because the, as long as there is a non-zero probability that we will be in state three at time one, 10,000, then obviously the probability of A is higher than B because any of the other states it's equal. And there is some probability that we're in state three and state three is only A. So A and B will be the same for the other two. And for this, which is non-zero, it will be one. So the total probability of A will be high. So the answer, yes, Daniel, the answer is yes. Um, even if it's non-terminal, but hey, honestly, we made it easy. And in this case it was terminal, so it's even easier. 
Good, okay. Let's go back to our inference problems and Yeah, okay, so I have another question about the transition. One second, let me show you the transition probability from of this one. Yeah, so the transition probability is defined here from S1, 0.5 to S1, 0.3 to S2. And there is an edge saying that there is a transition from S1 to S3, but it's not defined as there is no number here. As I said, you can calculate this number and understand that it's 0.2 because there's only three states in this model. And from S1, you have to transition to another state. So the, sub, the, the sum of the probabilities have to sum to one. So this has to be 0.2, even though we didn't put it as uh, 0.2. So this is something that we didn't give you, but you had to infer based on the uh, definition of a hidden mark. Okay, that's clear. Okay, so let's go back to our class or to the inference that we are doing. Okay, so we talked about inferring, uh, uh, or we talked about doing inference uh, when we don't see any observation, when we see a set of observation and we want to know what's the probability of a set of states or the probability of the last state. Now, as I said, in many cases, we care not so much about the probability of the last state or a set of states. We want to know what's the probability of the most likely set of states, right? So, Right, when we do speech processing, right? Uh, if I don't have any, uh, right? I said, if I have only three sentences, I can compare all of them. But if I don't have any, or, you know, I let you speak whatever you want, I really want to find out not what is the probability of every possible sentence. I, I wouldn't, you know, it's too long. I want to know what is the most likely sentence you said, right? Get me to an operator. Okay, so this is a, a, a speech processing very important, but it's also true in, in biology, right? We want to know what is the most likely set of genes or what is the most likely encoding of this part of the genome and so forth. So this is, oh, I should say one, one thing um, that you should know, this is why this is an arg max and not a max. There could be multiple, uh, 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 there could be multiple uh, uh, um, uh, states that have the same probability which is the maxima. So there's no guarantee that it's going to be only one. The algorithm we'll give now will give you, or we, actually you can get all of them, but it will give you, I mean, if there are ties, it will only give you one of them, okay? There are ways to find all of them, but again, the problem with that is that this can become exponential because the set of, the set of states is very large, right? It's basically exponential. So if you insist on getting all of the maximal ones, it could be that this will be exponential. So that's not good. So the algorithm I'll give you is going to give you one of the maximal ones. Definitely there's nothing more than that, but it doesn't mean that there are no other states or sets of states that have the same probability. Okay, that's important to realize about max. Yeah, so someone raised their hand. Um, hello, Professor. I have a question yeah. regarding um, the HMM2, question two. So I wonder if it has anything to do with the limit theorem of Markov transitions. No. Um, no, no. So I mentioned the limit theorem, but that doesn't have anything to do with that. This was about observation. So when you have the, the Markov transition assumes is, is independent of observation. In this case, because we see the observation, right, that's different. Right, so it's not, I mean, there is, I mean, once you see the observation, um, it, it gives you some other information that is in the, well, the, the limit theorem does not apply anymore. Gotcha. So, so it's not related to that. Again, the, the reason why the probability of A is higher is because it, it can come from, from oh, it's the only observation that can come from a state that we can be at. Right? Mm -hmm. The actual value of that, the probability that we will be there is, is not really important. As long as the other two are symmetric and this one is positive, then I said, I did mention that if you do want to compute it, you can use the limit theorem and you will see that the probability that we will be in state uh, in this state is more or less half. But you don't really need it to, to solve that problem. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, again, so we are talking about uh, inference and we are talking about inference of arg max, not necessarily the maximum, but one of them. Okay, so as we said, like if we have this set of, uh, if we have the observation from the die, what is the most likely set of states? How do we compose, how do we compute uh, the arg max or the most probable pass? Again, we are going to use a, a base rule here. 
And so argmax of Q of P of Q given O, which is what we are trying to compute, right? P of Q is the state, O is the observation, and, and argmax over Q is the set of states we want to find. And but using base rule, it's P of O given Q times P of U divided by P of O. P of O is the same. P of O is not a function of Q. So in order to maximize this, which is what we want to find Q, we just need to maximize the numerator, right? We don't care about the denominator. We don't really care about the probability. We just want to find the set of states that maximizes this. Once we have it, honestly, we can easily compute the probability because we already talked about how to compute for a given set of states, but that's not our goal at this stage. At this stage, our only goal is to find the best key, okay? So from now on, I'm going to ignore P of O. It doesn't change the, the maximal selection. So again, we are going to define a new uh, 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 quantity. Um, and this time we will call it delta, delta T of I. T again is the step, I is the state. And Q of T of I is defined as the set, the maximum, oh, again, this is a maximal set. It's not, it's the argmax. It's not the only max, but it's the maximal sets of states in which we have seen this set of states and these observations. So this is now an end, it's not an all, it's not a condition, right? So we're doing a joint here. But the definition is that this is, oh, there is no other set of states that if you do a joint with these set of observations, we'll have a higher probability. There could be a set of states that will have the same, but no one will have the higher probability. Okay, so we want to find the most likely sets that, um, Oh, sorry. So, so this is our max, but it has to, okay. So I take it back. So this is our max over Q1 to QT minus one. So this could be any of these states, but you have to finish in SI, right? So this is the only one that is constrained. And of course the observation are observed, but, but the last one has to be I. So we're trying to find the set of states that um, will lead to the highest probability given that the last state is I and the set of observations. Okay, oh, that's the idea. Okay, we will see why this is useful, but for now, again, like before, let's see how we compute it. So how do we compute delta T of I? Delta one of I is basically, what's the, pro it's, it's the probability, right? I mean, in this case, we only have the last one, which is the first one as well, right? So it's only Q1 equals SI and O1. So this is this definition, right? So this is pretty easy. Because we said the last one is fixed. In this case, the first is the last, so it's fixed. Okay, so how do we go from delta T of I to delta T plus one of I? Okay, how do we find the set of states that are the best, given that we know what are the ones that, um, that, that or, or, or we know the best set of states for the previous one? So what do we need to do? We need to see another emission, right? Because delta T, is using only emissions up to time t, delta t plus one uses another emission and we need to move to state i. So now we can use again the, the chain rule, the, sorry, we can use the, uh, well, we'll use the chain rule, but we can write this as this, right? So delta t plus one is q1 to qt, right? And we fix the last one to be si. Now, right? So, so this is maxim over, maximizing over all of the proper state of states. However, we already know that we compute the delta t for all of the states. So if we know the last state in this set here, q1 to qt, we can know what is the best set of states before that we already computed it. So we don't need to know sum over all possible values of one, two, three. The only thing we care about is the last one because we already computed everything before that. So now we basically take the max over J, which is the one before I in this case, max over J of Delta TJ. And we use then the chain rule, right? And, and we get the transition from J to I, right? Which is this here and the observation, which is just observing. I, OT plus one in state I, okay? But again, the idea is that if we sum over J, then we don't really need to take the maximization over Q1 to Q3 minus one because we already did it in the previous step. The only thing we care about now is what is the last state just before I. And this is basically Delta TJ or the, not the value of this set of states is Delta TJ. Okay, so we find max of J Delta TJ and, and, and that's it, okay? So delta T of plus one of I is defined as max over J, where J is the previous state, 
delta tj, aji, bi. So it's easy to do, right? In each step, we just compute that. Now, one important thing here, unlike before, is that it's not enough to just compute the value. We, we are not really interested in the value. That delta t basically gives us the max of the probability. It's important, we need it, but it's not the only thing we need. We also need to know what is the state. So when you compute delta t plus one i, you also need to record what is the j that led to this maximum. I, I mean, we will use one j. There could be multiple ones, but we will use one j basically to compute this maximum because we max over j, we find one of them. So I can record that for t plus one, I used for state i, I used, state, let's say state i is state a, I used state a in the previous time point. Okay, and for state b, I used state a as well. And this way I record for each state, what is the previous state that had the maximum leading to that, right? This is easy to do because in order to set delta t plus one, I need to select j. That's part of the definition. So I record this j and then I will use it as you will see in a second. So for this, we can use dynamic programming. The runtime is very simple. It's, it's basically, uh, or the runtime computation is the same. Right here, we don't do summation, we do max, but max is the same number of operations of summation. We have to do it n times for, right? Because we, we compute it for, for state i, we compute it for state one, two, three, four, and five, and we do it for all the states. So this is still n square for each iteration. And we do it t iterations, we have to do it t times. So it's again, t times n square. And once we do it, um, so once we got it, right, we can compute P of Q given O as basically the path defined by the R max of J delta TJ. What does it mean? If we are in a Q, if we are looking for the best set of uh, states, right? If you look at this, if you look at our definition, right? The last set of states, Right, the last set of states is the state that gives us the highest probability. Right, p of q. Should, maybe I should. P of o given q times p of q given the chain rule is p of o and q. Right. So if we arg max over this, which is what we are doing here, we will find the best q. Now, how do we find the arg max over this? If we compute all the values up to t, up to big t then there is only one state or those maybe multiple, but, there's, but, but there is going to be a state which will lead us the, 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 the most, the highest value of P of O and Q, which is what we need to find P of Q given O. So we find that J, that J is the J that maximizes Delta T of J, where T is the last time point. Once we find that J, we know that this is the last state. How do we find that state before that? We keep track, as we said, how do we got from t minus one, how do we got to this for j? So we take that and then t minus two and so forth. Okay, this is again, something that people do quite a lot in dynamic programming and we just need to keep track of how we got here. But once we do that, basically this computes p of q and o, which is what we need in order to compute this max here, right? So this is p of o q. Okay, and this is basically the arg max. This gives us the, set, the, the last, Basically, this thing here is, is defined by the state that maximizes the last value of delta t. We find that, we backtrack, and we find the set of states. As I said, this set of states is not necessarily the only set of states that leads to this value, but there is no other set of states that lead to a higher value. That's the thing that I This is called the Viterbi algorithm, even though it's just a dynamic programming algorithm, uh, but it's a very important one. It's used a lot. In, in, Inference in, in basically this is usually one of the major inference tasks in hidden Markov networks. Okay, so this is it. That's it for inference. Oh, actually not completely it. We will see in a sec or not in a second. In the next lecture we will see another inference problem that is required for learning. Not so much to answer questions, but we already um, know how to answer most of the most important questions in, in, in hidden Markov models. So we know how to predict what state we are going to end up in specific term with annual observation. Given a set of observations, we can state what state we are in or what is the probability of a specific set of states or what is the probability of a specific set of observations, which we did as part of this, but that's, as we said, very important for classification. And we can also compute the argmax, which is Viterbi algorithm for finding the best set or the most likely set of states or a most likely set, there's multiple ones 
for a set of observations. Okay, so this is it for inference. The next step is to do learning, right? So until now, we assumed that someone gave us, so until now we assumed that someone gave us, of course, the uh, parameters, right? And, and we said already in, in hidden, or oh, I should say, uh, in hidden Markov models, right? This is the hidden Markov model we defined. It has a set of states. It has an initial probability, pi i, the probability of starting in any state, a transition probability from any state to any other state, and an emission probability based on the language that the, the, the model defined. The language or the set of emissions is usually do very domain specific. However, the set of states is not always known, right? So if you have a grid for a room, maybe you know the set of states, but let's say you're in Vegas and there is a dealer that flips a set of dice and you don't know how many dice this guy is flipping. Maybe he's using one, maybe he's using two and he has some transition probability, maybe he's using three, right? So assuming that we know the set of states is not always a trivial thing, okay? We are going to discuss learning and hidden Markov models, but we will still assume that we know how many states there are. That's not always the case. There are cases where we don't know how many states there are. We are not going to discuss algorithms for this, but people have worked on the trying to determine how many states there are. That's a separate issue, but very important one in practice, okay? But for now, we will assume that we know how many states there are. We don't know the parameters of the states, but we know how many states there are. And of course, we know the vocabulary, okay? So let's say our goal is now given, and, and of course, we see a set of, we, we see not one set, but we see a lot of sets of observations. So we go to Vegas, and we record the dealer fl uh, uh, flipping the, the die, I don't know, 50 times, 100 times each time. Each session is, let's say, a few minutes. And, and you start with, based on the initial probability, you flip a die, get the output, transition, and so forth. And you get a set of observations, one, 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 two. This is one set. Then you get the second set, the third set, and so forth. And given this set of observations, of course, we don't know the states. So the assumption is we don't know anything. We just need the set. But we don't have only one set of observations. We have a, sub, a, a number of sets of observations. Our goal is to learn the parameters. OK? So that will be our task. And again, parameters, it's the initial probability, transition probability, and, and, and emission probability. Right, and then there's, I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of uh, um, things that are going on here, right? For example, if you want to build um, a, a, a speech processing, you need to define how the words are being pronounced, right? Um, so how, how is the word AI or machine learning being pronounced? So you need a model to associate the waveform, the, the speech part with the, so that's one thing. And the other is you need to learn the probability between the states. So for example, if you think the dictionary is, and again, in this case, the states will be words from the dictionary, right? They are defined um, by, by someone. Um, uh, but if you want to learn transition probability, right? AI class or machine learning class and so forth. As I said, while we discuss learning, we are not going to discuss uh, how to get the set of states. That's assuming, or we assume that this is, Okay, so if we observe a set of uh, values, let's say not even, so let's say we observe it one, two, two, five, six, and we know that they come from this model, right? We know they come from, and there is also initial probability that I'm not putting here, but we know they come from a model with two states. So two dice that can transition to themselves or to the other one, we don't know what they are and we don't know the initial probability. How can we determine the initial transition and emission probabilities? Not very easy, right? I mean, because we don't know, of course, anything about how to associate each of the observation with each of the states. However, we can make our life very easy if we observe the states. If I told you that in the first time point, we're in state A, in the second time point, we're in state B, in the third, we're in state A, in the first, we're in state A, five and six. If I told you the states, then learning the parameters, basically the emission and position probability is very easy. It becomes basically a maximum likelihood estimation problem. 
because I have the state, I have a set of observations, so it's a multivariate distribution, right? One, two, one. And I, if I have enough observation, I can easily do MLE. Similarly for transitions, right? I have transitions from A to B, uh, from let's say two states, right? A to B and A to A. It's a binomial model. I have to transition from A to one of the other states, A or B. If I see enough transitions, I see A, B, A, 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 B, A, 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 B, A, 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 I can learn using MLE the transition probability. So if I see the set of observations, so if I see the set of states, if I can associate with each of these observations, the state, this becomes a pretty simple uh, MLE problem. Unfortunately, of course, we don't have the set of states, but if we had, then we can easily, right? If we see this set of states, right? Let's say we see, as I said, we have multiple observations, not one observation, but we have multiple observations. And for each one, we have the set of states. So let's say this is the set of states we initially see A, A, B, B, A, A. Then it's easy to learn the initial probability, right? We can just look at which state we started with and computer binomial distribution in this case and say, this is the probability of the initial state. We can look at the transitions, right? How many times we saw A going to A versus how many times we saw A going to B. And this is the maximum likelihood, just the count of maximum likelihood, right? So this is the initial probability, just counting how many times we started with the state, and right? So just the number of times we were in A divided by the total number of observations we had. We can easily learn the transition probabilities, right? Again, MLE. Right, we just count how many times we went from A to B versus total number of times we were in A, right? Because we have to go from A to B or to A to A. And similarly, emission probability is a multivariate distribution, yeah, multinomial, sorry, distribution. Okay, so again. So, so this is very uh, simple, of course, if we uh, observe the states, as I said, in practice, we go to Vegas, we do not observe the state. The, the, the dealer is using to die, but he doesn't let us, or she doesn't let us see what state he or she is using at each time. So we need to do it fully unsupervised. However, as I said, this is good to know because it turns out that there is an algorithm that you already learned and we'll talk about it next time that can fill in a missing value. In this case, we have a missing value, right? If we knew, the, uh, the observation, if we knew the states, we can easily learn the parameters. On the other hand, from the previous lecture, we already said that if we know the parameters, we can also say, what are the, what are the hidden states? That's the inference thing, right? If I know the parameters, I can tell you what state you were at each time. So this is like an EM algorithm. I won't go into it because, you know, this is the next one. This, uh, I, won't, I, I don't want to start it now, but we will talk about it next time. And the basic idea will be to treat it like a missing observation thing, where the missing observations are the state. And then if you know the missing observation, it's easy to compute the MLE. If you don't know, but you have the parameters, it's easy to compute the expectation of the missing observations. We will iterate and this is the EM algorithm. Okay, so this is a, a, a how you use, or this is generally the idea of um, using a, a learning. Yeah, and, and we'll get to EM, how to do EM and, and I mean, that's the next lecture I don't want to go. So if you have questions about that, keep them for next time. And um, I want to say a, a, a one thing. So exam, um, I will talk more about it maybe next time, but exam is in two weeks. So, you know, it's not too early. It's, we call it a midterm, but it's the only exam in class. So of course we, we are not going to have a final. And I wrote a post on, on Piazza on why we have done that and what, what, but anyway, the exam, uh, Daniel wrote a, a, a very detailed post about the exam, about the topics in the exam, please take a look. We haven't covered all of them yet, but we will by the time the exam takes place. Um, so take a look at that. And as Daniel note, uh, we just posted, um, I will hold a review session in a bit less than two weeks um, where I will discuss um, not all the topics, but some of the topics, especially those that I covered in my classes, the important thing is not really to cover these topics because I'm not going to teach anything new. I'm going to just show you some previous exam questions and, and solve them. And even though you have all the solutions, I may just emphasize some of the ideas and explain, and more importantly, explain what we are trying to do in exams. So for example, exam questions, if you look at them are very different from problem set from questions. 
and there is, a, there is a reason for that. So I will mention that and try to explain what we are trying to achieve in exams in the, um, in the uh, uh, review session in two weeks. Okay, so that's it. And I'll see everybody on Wednesday. We will continue to discuss HMMs and specifically we'll talk about learning in HMMs. And quick questions of just while everyone is here. Um, are you going to be recording the session? I'm happy to record it. Sure. Okay. The, the review session? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, do you want me to record? Yeah, I guess John wouldn't be on it. So I can record. Sure. I should be able to record it. Yeah. I think it records automatically. So I think it should be fine. Okay. I'll, let's put it this way I'll make every effort to record it, um, but you should make every effort to attend in case this doesn't work. Well, you don't have, I, sorry, as Daniel wrote, there's no requirement. You don't have to attend. If you want to attend, then you should attend. There's no requirement. Okay. See you.